Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wright, and I'm the author of several books on the environment, including Bottle Mania, How Water Went on Sale, and Why We Bought It. I'm talking today with Sandra Postel, who's the founder of the Global Water Policy Project. Sandra is also the Post Carbon Institute's Water Fellow and the National Geographic Society's Freshwater Fellow. We'll be talking today about water footprints and what we can do as individuals and communities to shrink our water footprints. So Sandra, can you start us off by telling us what a water footprint is? It's a way of measuring our impact on, on fresh water. Um, it, it measures both the direct uses of water, you know, the water that's coming out of our tap and out of our faucets at home, um, as well as all the indirect ways in which we use water. Um, water's embedded in just about everything we use on a daily basis. So it's embedded in the food we eat, it's embedded in the energy we use, it's embedded in the clothes we wear, uh, just about everything that makes up our lifestyle. So this water footprint idea is a way to help us think about all the ways in which we're using water directly and indirectly and how we can maybe think about reducing it. That's, that's a great explanation, but tell me, why should I care about my water footprint if I live in a pretty wet place? That's a great question, um, and it's an important question. And if you think about your water footprint, um, about 55% of the average American's water footprint is related to their diet. And so diet is actually by far the biggest component of it. It's the food we eat every day. And it takes a lot of water to, uh, to produce that food. You think about a, a hamburger, for example, can easily take 630 gallons of water to make one hamburger. Cup of coffee, 40 gallons of water to make a cup of coffee. Um, so the food we eat is, is, is really important in terms of our, of our water footprint. So whether you're living in a wet place or a dry place, we're getting food from many, many different watersheds around the world. I mean, our coffee may come from Ethiopia or Guatemala. Uh, our hamburgers are probably coming from uh, cattle feedlot operations in the, in the Midwest, which use a lot of water to grow the corn that feed the cow. So even if we're living someplace completely different, we're having an impact through our consumption choices, our diet choices, on watersheds all around the world. Same thing with our, with our clothes, for example, and all the material goods that we buy. The cotton may come from Pakistan or India or Uzbekistan, maybe Arizona. Um, but whether we live in Massachusetts or Maine or uh, a drier part of the country, the things we're buying are having an impact um, on those watersheds in, in very distant places sometimes. A last good example is energy, um, where the, uh, the electricity we use, the, the oil and, and, and gas that we use, all have a water footprint. And again, those are coming often from, from very distant places. Um, every time we, we fill up our car with, with a gallon of gasoline, we have to think about 13 gallons of water going into that gallon of gasoline. So it all has, it all has an impact. But the, the water we're using at home is also really, really important too. Even though it makes up maybe 5% of our total footprint, this is our watershed. This is where we live. This is where we work. This is where we play. So the water that we use at home uh, to irrigate our landscapes, if we have a, a landscape that needs irrigation, the water that's um, in our homes for showering and washing the dishes and flushing the toilet, this is water that's usually coming from a watershed that's fairly close to home. Not always, but usually. So how we use water at home can really impact our local watershed and, and its health, too. Well, let's talk a little bit about how we can shrink that, that water footprint. I think we've all heard about turning off the sink while we're brushing our teeth. But um, as you said, diet is a big part of it and clothing and energy. So how, how do we go beyond just turning off, this, off the kitchen or bathroom sink? Where else can we make a, a big difference? Well, I think the first thing is really understanding what these different components of our individual water footprint are. Um, as I mentioned, diet is, is the biggest one, about 55% here in, in the United States for the average American. Um, energy, electricity, and how we transport ourselves is the second biggest, and that's about 35%. And much of that is because thermoelectric power uh, the uh, takes a lot of water, uh, the water withdrawn from rivers and streams and lakes around the country to produce 
electricity from coal and nuclear power plants, what we call thermoelectric power, coal, oil, gas, and nuclear, um, takes a lot of water. Um, about one out of every two gallons of water extracted from our ecosystems here in this country goes to cool down thermoelectric power plants. So to the extent we save energy, we're saving water. And that's a really important message. Um, the third thing is the water at home. Uh, that, again, it's our local watershed. So one of the biggest things we can do now uh, to, to conserve water at home is to think about our use of water outdoors. Uh, we've done pretty well in this country in uh, requiring that we have water efficient fixtures inside the home. So toilets and faucets and um, shower heads now all have to meet fairly strict standards of water efficiency. So when you go out and buy a new toilet, it's going to be at least a certain degree of efficient, more efficient than it was 15, 20 years ago. So that's good. But we haven't done nearly as well outdoors. Um, and the average American uses half or more of their household water use outdoors. So thinking about the climate in which we live and then having landscapes that are appropriate for that climate and that require little or no irrigation can make a big, big difference. Um, so planting water efficient shrubs, planting climate appropriate grasses and shrubs and trees and flowers can create a very, very attractive landscape but use a lot less water than we're now using. You just don't want um, a thirsty green lawn um, in and around places like Las Vegas and Phoenix, especially. So thinking about climate appropriate landscapes is very, very important. And the last thing is our overall consumption of stuff. Um, we don't tend to shop every day, so this is not as big a component of our, of our footprint as the things we do every day, eat, use water, um, use energy. But it's still a significant share, about 5% for the clothes and computers and all the electronic gadgets and all the toys and all the paper that we use um, every day. So again, thinking about consumption, can we think about maybe buying 25% less stuff and still be just as happy, just as satisfied? Probably. Do we really need that 20th t-shirt, which takes a thousand gallons of water to make? Probably not. So maybe just being a bit more conscious of our consumption and not depriving of us of things we need to enjoy our lives and that sort of thing, but, but things we really don't need. And I think most of us, if we're honest, could easily say, yeah, I could reduce buying my stuff by 10, 15, 20% quite easily. So all those things add up and they can and they can make a difference. I, I hear what you're saying about individuals. I think this is great stuff, but I keep remembering that it's agriculture that uses 70% of the water on this planet. And there's a lot of focus on residential use and what we as individuals can do. Can, can you talk just a little bit about why um, water experts talk so much about residential use and not um, what businesses and industry and um, which use more than individuals and then agriculture, which is this huge chunk of the water pie. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, people often ask me, I turn off the tap while I'm brushing my teeth, what more can I do? And so this idea of thinking about the individual footprint, um, diet, energy, household use, and miscellaneous stuff, is a way to get individuals involved and in feeling like they're doing something important, which they are. But the other piece is exactly what you've just brought up, which is um, what corporations, what the agricultural industry itself, uh, irrigators, farmers, what, what everyone who's involved in the production of all the things that we consume can do. And here again, this is, this is a, a, a brand new day for this, and a lot of work is going on. Um, Agriculture is very, very important. 70%, uh, as you say, of all the water that we withdraw from rivers, lakes, aquifers around the world goes to irrigation, goes to irrigate the crops and agricultural products that, that we consume. And so making agriculture more efficient, irrigating more efficiently, uh, more use of drip irrigation to get more crop per drop um, is really important uh, to shrinking our footprint overall, the footprint of humanity overall, to free up water for nature. What we're talking about here is, is reducing humanity's overall water footprint so that that finite supply of water can be used to meet other important needs, to, su to sustain river flows and to sustain the habitats in rivers and, and uh, sustain the fish and all the aquatic 
organisms um, that, that keep the web of life functioning. This is what we're talking about, that our footprint is so large now as a species that we're degrading the ecosystems upon which all life, including us, depend. And so it's really about living more sustainably on, on the earth. And so corporations and the agricultural sector, very, very important that they begin thinking about their entire production process, their supply chain, so to speak, and examining how they, too, can uh, be part of the solution. And this is beginning to happen. Um, we're beginning to see a shift toward more drip irrigation, but it's slow. Uh, still less than 2% of, of world irrigated land, for example, is under drip irrigation, which is the most efficient way uh, we know of to irrigate. We can do, we can do much better. You know, I was just going to ask what role government might have in pushing corporations or um, farmers to adopt these conservation and efficiency strategies. How can we push it forward? I think it's in a number of ways. Um, for one, water is priced very, very low, just about everywhere. Um, farmers are rarely paying more than 15% of the real cost of the water that they're using. Um, corporations, too, often paying so little for water that it really doesn't factor into their um, budget considerations, their cost considerations very much. And so they don't have as much incentive to invest in ways of using water more efficiently, recycling it, and so on. The pollution control laws that we've passed have had a very beneficial impact on water conservation as well. Uh, as a result of the Clean Water Act and the subsequent amendments to it, it's turned out that, that many corporations find it makes more economic sense to recycle and reuse their water inside their factories than to treat it and release it to the environment. And so a lot of corporations have, have done that. What, what makes the most sense now, though, is to also give incentives to think about the entire supply chain. Um, if you think about a food and beverage company, for example, most of their water footprint occurs not in the factory, but actually where they're growing the product, so growing the sugar cane or growing uh, the coffee beans. This is where the biggest part of that 40 gallons of, of, of water per cup of coffee comes from is in growing the beans. And so incentives to make that efficient, uh, that supply chain as efficient as possible um, could go a long way towards shrinking uh, these water footprints. Well, thank you for all your time today, Sandra. Um, viewers can learn more about their water footprints, conservation, and efficiency by visiting the National Geographic Society's Water Footprint Calculator. And you can go to this website and find out how much water you're using in your home and how you can shrink that footprint. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much, Elizabeth.